Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Uh, welcome to episode 106, I believe it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you at things that are important to me and I think deserve your attention. Any comments, questions, reactions can be sent to me directly at whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And since I know you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, uh, and get the email address from there. I do answer my emails, sometimes a little slow about it, so have a little patience. Uh, but if you do email me, please include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show in the subject line so I know it's not spam. And actually, I should probably just pre-record that whole beginning so that uh, I could uh, just skip having to do it every week. Any event, hi there. Yes, we're going to get started. We're going to get started. Actually, um, let's start with a hero award. Hero award. The hero award is given as the occasion arises for people who simply do the right thing. This week, our, hero, our heroes is a group of four. Uh, left to right, they are, and I think I've got the names in the right order, they are Killa Bloodworth, Konisha Wallace, Stephanie Sinnott, and Marisha Rucker. They are seniors at Wilcox County High School in southern Georgia, and they have been, they say, friends since the fourth grade. This year, they advocated for, raised money for, and organized the first integrated senior prom in this school's history. See, the school doesn't sponsor the proms. When the school was desegregated in 1971, the proms were turned into private, invitation-only events sponsored by the parents, and they were segregated. Well, these four students set up a Facebook page to raise money, which raised enough money not only to rent a ballroom, but also to provide a gift bag for everyone who came, and they say they have money left over to help some local needy families. They had a very simple uh, interest, very simply desire to do an integrated prom. They wanted to go to the prom together. So, almost 60 years after the Supreme Court supposedly got rid of separate but equal, on April 27th, many high school students in Wilcox County, Georgia, had their first integrated senior prom. And it came off without a hitch and everyone had a great time. Uh, one student said, everyone goes to school together, sits together at lunch, so we're at prom together. It's about time people started recognizing. Apparently, though, not everyone was willing to do that. The, the four students said people kept hitting them with the, it's always been this way, line. And uh, posters put up around school advertising the integrated prom kept getting torn down. And there is still a whites-only prom going on. Still, the... Uh, the road to change is rarely smooth. Uh, it's rarely easy, and even more rarely does it come quickly. But uh, there is a road, and these students now have gone far enough down this road that the school is saying that next year they are going to try to see if they can put together a school-sponsored prom that everybody can attend. And that makes these four high school students heroes. Oh, a quick footnote to this before I move on. Don't cut the school any slack on the basis of their private parties business, the school does sponsor a homecoming dance, and that is still segregated. Okay, on to uh, less happy news. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly, at least I, I intend for it to be relatively brief, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about a couple of thoughts that were prompted by the Boston Marathon bombings, just things I want to put out there for your consideration. One of them, the first one, has to do with the reaction to the, uh, uh, to, to the hunt for Zokhar Tsarnaev. When he was caught, people were out in the streets cheering, waving, chanting, USA, USA. Why? I mean, really, why? I mean, this was, this was not just relief. This was well beyond relief. Uh, put it this way, if he had been a bank robber who had shot a bank guard, stolen a hunk of money, carjacked a car, later shot a cop, and was, and, and was described as being armed and dangerous and in the neighborhood, would the reaction have been the same? Would the police reaction have been the same? Would there have been tanks in Watertown? Would the reaction of the people have been the same? Would his capture have been the cause for them to rush out in the street cheering and waving flags? 
Why are we such a frightened people? Why are we such a frightened people that this one guy was able to turn Boston and Watertown into ghost towns? Schools and businesses were closed. Uh, trains, subways, roads, empty. Streets looked like a post-apocalyptic movie set. Baseball games, cultural events were all canceled. All of this in response to a 19-year-old fugitive, armed and dangerous, yes, but still alone, on foot, and clearly identified in the media. This one person caused the whole two cities, and don't give me any of that Boston strong nonsense, all right? Because that really is nonsense. I, I, I really don't want to hear it. Cops are telling people to stay inside. Nobody in, nobody out. It was lock your doors. Um, be afraid to be in the streets. Be afraid to answer your door. People are even told to stay away from the windows. It was like be afraid even to look outside. Stay in your house with the lights out and the blinds drawn until you're told that it's safe. And then after the guy is caught, you start out in the streets going, oh yeah, we strong, we strong. No, you're not. You're scared. Scared enough to surrender your civil liberties without making a fuss. Former Representative Ron Paul, he's a, he's a man who puts a political context to the phrase idiot savant. Um, the, the other day he wrote that the response of law enforcement to the bombings should frighten us more than the bombings themselves. Quoting him, forced lockdown of a city, militarized police riding tanks in the streets, door-to-door -door armed searches without warrant, families thrown out of their homes at gunpoint to be searched without probable cause, businesses forced to close, transport shut down. These are not the scenes from a military coup in a far-off banana republic, but rather scenes in Boston as the United States got a taste of martial law. The Boston bombing provided the opportunity for government to turn what should have been a police investigation into a military-style occupation of an American city. I mean, I mean, there are tanks in the streets of an American city, and it's not an Armed Forces Day parade. There were videos of the door-to-door -door searches. There were people who made videos out of their windows. And also, Channel 7 in Boston covered the same thing. There are videos of heavily armed and heavily armored cops going up, banging on doors, and when somebody answers the door, that person has loaded guns pointed in their face. They're marched out of the house with their hands in the air. Everyone in the house is, sh is, is shoveled out, sent down the street to be searched without cause or warrant, while the cops run into the house like they're engaging in combat. And they went down the street, house after house, doing the same thing. And in a move that would have made Orwell grin with happy recognition, the officials had the utter, the monumental gall to call these armed home invasions, they called them rescuing the occupants. And we're supposed to think this is okay. We're supposed to accept this. Somehow, Passively submitting to this is somehow supposed to prove we're strong. No, it doesn't. If anything, it proves the opposite. It shows just how frightened we are, just how fragile our freedoms are, and just how readily we will surrender them to power as soon as the magic talisman of terrorism is waved in our face. As soon as that talisman is invoked, the Constitution, <laughs> what Constitution? I also don't want to hear any blather about public safety, all right? Public safety. Daniel Webster, he said it well. I'm quoting him here. Good intentions will always be pleaded for every assumption of authority. There are men in all ages who mean to govern well, but they mean to govern. They promise to be good masters, but they mean to be masters. It's like a conditioned reflex. We hear the word terrorism and any legitimate fear we might have had, any rational concern we might have had, suddenly skyrockets by an order of magnitude or more, and the words le legitimate and rational just go out the window. Why? Why? Why has a people that likes to pride itself on its supposed daring spirit as we tell our stories of how we dared to cross the oceans and we dared to cross the plains and prairies and we dared to step out into space? How did that people, a people who, who, whose nation was born in revolution, a people whose third president, Thomas Jefferson, said, I'm quoting here, the spirit of resistance to government is so valuable at times that I wish it to be always alive. 
How did that people become so timorous, so afraid that we guard our freedoms as simply based on nothing more than the sufferance of the powerful? Why are we such a frightened people? And there is actually a, a, a political aspect to this. Since 9-11, a total of 16 people in the, in the United States have been killed as a result of Muslim terrorism. Even if we're to just speculate wildly on motives, include Boston and it comes to 13. That is one, I'm sorry, it comes to 19 rather. That 19 is one more than the number of people who were killed by guns in the United States on the day of the bombing. And it is less than half the average, I'm sorry, a little more than half of the average day's total, which is about 30. There's it's just, the average American is more likely to die of malaria than to die in Muslim terrorism. Meanwhile, the number of anti-government so-called patriot groups, these are groups that say they are interested in overthrowing the government because they think the government is going to come and take their guns and oppose socialism. The number of such groups is at an all-time high in 2012. And according to a study coming out of the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, in that same period, that is the period since 9-11, over 250 people in this country have been killed as the result of right-wing violence. But we don't talk about that. In fact, when the Department of Homeland Security, the Department for the Protection of the Fatherland, when the DHS came out with a report about right-wing extremism in 2009, the, the reactionaries in Congress screamed so loud that the agency had to withdraw the report. So not only don't we talk about it, pol politically we're not even allowed to talk about this. So I'm going to ask this again. Why are we a frightened people? How did that come to be? And why is that fear so narrowly and apparently wrongly focused? And now, perhaps most importantly, who does that fear serve? Ultimately, I think Ben Franklin had it right. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. America in 2013 appears to be among Franklin's undeserving. All right, the other thing I wanted to raise uh, out, out of Boston is uh, rather more philosophical than that. In the same week as the Boston bombings, there were at least 34 people killed, over 100 injured, and up to 1,000 homes destroyed in an earthquake along the Iran-Pakistan border. In the same week as the Boston bombings, another earthquake struck China's Sichuan province, leaving whole villages in rubble, over 200 people either dead or missing, over 11,000 injured and 17,000 homeless. In the same week as the Boston bombings, in the small town of West Texas, a fertilizer plant that hadn't had a federal safety inspection in 28 years caught fire and exploded, resulting in the deaths of at least 14 people and the destruction of the surrounding neighborhoods. Every one of those cases, the same week as the Boston bombings, every one of those cases involved more people killed, at least as many or a whole lot more many people injured, and more property damage than occurred in Boston. By any standard measure of tragedies, these were greater tragedies. More deaths, more injuries, more property damage. So why don't they feel that way? Why don't they feel like bigger tragedies? I mean, why the difference? Why do some things hit us more than others? We can say that, you know, two of them were in foreign countries and Americans never care about disasters in foreign countries, which is a completely unsatisfying answer, both because it's not completely true and because it still doesn't answer the question of why. Why the difference? And in any event, that can't be applied to Texas. And I know somebody out there is going to be going, hey, Texas is like a foreign country, ha, ha, ha. But no, I'm not interested in the jokes. This is about real people's lives. And the thing is, I want to emphasize here, I'm not making a judgment. I'm not saying that people are callous because they don't care as much about this as they do about that. Or that they're being overly sensitive because they care more about that than you do about this. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about why. Why does that happen? That's what I'm interested in. And, and a broader question, I'm interested in, how does that relate to the psychology of what it means to be on the left or the right? About how you perceive the world and how that affects how you view the world, left or right. 
why do some things strike us emotionally harder than others? I just want to throw that out there for your consideration. All right, from there we're going to go on to one of our regular features, the Clown Award. It's given as needed for acts of meritorious stupidity. This is a picture of Jason Collins. He is not the recipient of the Big Red Nose this week. Absolutely not, by no means. What he is is a 34-year-old journeyman center in the NBA. He's never been a star in the league, although he was the starting center for the New Jersey Nets team that made the NBA Finals 10 years ago. He became a star, though, of a different sort. In the May 6th issue of Sports Illustrated, which came out on April 29th, he said, I'm gay. He became the first active male athlete in a major U.S. team sport to do so. That includes the NHL, the NFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball. Six former players in one of those sports have come out as being gay, but they all did it after they retired. He is the first active male athlete in a major sport to a major team sport to do so. Now, leaving aside twits like Phil Jackson, who claimed that he never met a gay NBA player in his coaching career, uh, the reaction of the sports world was overwhelmingly positive. In fact, even his own team, the, the current team, the, the Washington Wizards, they released a statement saying that they were quite proud of him and his determination to live openly and described him as a leader on and off the court and a great teammate. Even the White House got in on the act. Michelle Obama tweeted her support, and the Prez actually called Jason to, uh, to express his support. Okay, so who's the clown? It's this guy. He's Chris Broussard. He's a sportscaster for ESPN. And in response to Collins coming out, he launched into a bigoted homophobic rant. I'm quoting him here, I don't believe that you can live an openly homosexual lifestyle. If you're openly living that type of lifestyle, then the Bible says you know them by their fruits. It says that's a sin. So Collins is, he said, openly living in unrepentant sin. Now, Collins said in his, in his article, my parents instilled Christian values in me and that I take the teachings of Jesus seriously, particularly the ones toward tolerance and understanding, but apparently Broussard was not listening to the last part. Instead, Broussard ranted that Collins is walking in open rebellion to God and to Jesus Christ and that he would not characterize Collins as a Christian. So apparently Chris Broussard, who thinks that everything would have been fine if uh, Jason Collins just kept his mouth shut, believes that he personally can decide who is and who is not a Christian. Well, I personally can decide who is and is not a clown, and Chris Broussard is definitely on the is side of that ledger. And we are taking a break. And we're back, and we're back. Uh, now look, I've been talking recently about the, the economic state in which we find ourselves. And I've been talking, trying to talk about it in broad generalities, not getting down into like wonky statistics and details and whatnot. The thing is, in, in talking about these broad generalities, I've tried to point out a, a basic issue, which is that more and more of our wealth, more and more of our income is going to fewer and fewer people. And that the proportional divide among the various segments is getting even wider. Uh, we used, not that long ago, we used to talk about the richest 20% versus the other 80%. Then it became the richest 10% versus the other 90%. Now we talk about the 1% versus the 99%. But even that doesn't really express the growing inequality. Because you look at the difference between the 10% and the 90%, that difference is every bit as great between the 1% and the other 9%. And within the 1%, that proportional difference is just as great between the one-tenth of 1% and the rest of the 1%. The inequality magnifies as you go higher and higher up the scale. It's getting worse and worse. And at the same time, more and more of our economy is under the control of fewer and fewer larger and larger corporations. Again, it's more and more wealth and power going into fewer and fewer hands. That is what we face. Now, I've raised this gently before. I'm going to raise it bluntly now. Uh, 
We are at a point where we have to start asking basic questions. We have spent decades careening from one economic, social, political, and military crisis to another, only to, at the end of it all, to find that we're little removed from where we were at the beginning. And despite all of this, despite what we get told, this is not because of a lack of leadership. It's not because of inadequate bipartisanship. It's because of a shared attitude among all of our leaders across both major parties that, that says that we can combat our problems without examining the basic premises of the policies or the social and political structures out of which those policies grow. I mean, every society has its social, its economic, its political structure. Okay, So I'm talking about what ours are. Um, the fact is, the assumption that is made by our leaders is that those basic structures, the economic and political structures, are sound. And it comes down to, political debates usually come down to, even at the state level, usually come down to, do we need to tinker a little bit more, or have we already tinkered a little too much? As a British writer, whose name I've unfortunately forgotten, put it some time ago, Americans seem to think what we've done hasn't worked, so let's do it again, only harder. The thing is, doing it harder is not going to work is not going to work. Our society structures are not sound. They are basically seriously flawed. Our social structure divides us by race and sex, favoring some and brutalizing others. Our political structure divides us constantly into minority and minor majority and minority rulers and ruled, telling us it's the same thing while actually serving to protect the privilege of a few. Our economic structure slices us into rich and poor, boss and worker, and to a greater extent than most of, us, most of us would ever care to admit, owner and owned. We have got to admit at some point that the problems, that the, that the problems we face, like the worst long-term unemployment ever, the persistence of poverty, growing economic inequality, growing political power of the rich and the corporations, the persistence of racism and sexism, the too easy reach for drones as a tool of foreign policy, the inability to act against global warming, the knee-jerk reflex to answer every, every economic question with cut spending, all those and more, these are not aberrations of the system. They are the system. They're direct outgrowths of a socioeconomic system that places its greatest value on power and control, that encourages competition and discourages cooperation, that persistently divides America and the world into a variety of we's and they's. I said this last week. It's time we have to face the fact that we need to seriously rethink our economy. And if you want to know what perspective I bring to this, I'm about to tell you. Years ago, when I was more politically active than I am now, people would often ask you about, you know, what your perspective was. And well, one way to answer that question is, is how I describe myself on my blog, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, plug, plug. Um, I say they're quoting there, I'm a democratic socialist green with an anarchist bent and a civil liberties absolutist who has, by both logical conclusion and moral compulsion, a commitment to active nonviolence. The only isms I wholeheartedly endorse are skepticism and eclecticism. Or, as I used to put it more flippantly, I'm a socialist, anarchist, communalist, capitalist, eclecticist, iconoclast. A description which left most people just smiling slightly dazedly convinced the right wing that I was actually a communist and sent the left wing uh, doctrinaire folks into ranting about contradictions. But this is what it actually means. I'm a capitalist in that I believe in the small business, the neighborhood level business, the mom par store, the small factory, that kind of thing. I'm a communalist, not communist, communalist, and then I believe that cooperative ventures are better than competitive ones. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence to actually back that up. The fact is, if you want competition, take up sports, okay? Take up chess. I'm a socialist, and then I believe that beyond a certain point, profit-oriented enterprises cannot be trusted to be responsible to the communities in which they operate. And at that point, the communities have the duty, they have the responsibility and the right to step in and start making some decisions. I'm an anarchist and that I'm a strong believer in personal freedom and individual rights. Uh, I th take Henry David Thoreau's statement, that government is best which governs least, amend it slightly to that government is best which governs as little as possible as little as necessary, rather. I'm an, and finally, I'm an eclecticist, and I believe that you can uh, put these threads together into a coherent f philosophy. I'm, uh, I'm an iconoclast in that I believe in the statement, the only ultimate answer is that there's no other ultimate answer. 
If we ever built a society along the lines I envisioned, the first thing I would do is try to see what's wrong with that society and how that could be made better. So that's the perspective I bring to this. You want to know um, uh, a reason why we need to rethink? I'm going to give you one. It's our outrage of the week. You probably heard about the collapse of a factory in Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh. It was on April 24th. The death toll has now passed 400. 149 are still missing. Some 2,500 people are injured. The people inside this factory were garment workers. Uh, they were paid a pittance and forced by their bosses to work in a factory with great big cracks in the walls and the foundation, which government inspectors had actually ordered closed the day before, also that we can wear overpriced fashion jeans. What you probably didn't hear, unless you were tuned to the internet, is that Matt, I'm not a progressive, I just play one online, Iglesias, a columnist for Slate, wasn't particularly troubled by that fact. He was more troubled by the suggestion someone made that what's needed is some minimum international standard for factory safety. In a column titled, and I'm serious, different places have different safety rules and that's okay, he argued that it's entirely appropriate for Bangladesh to have lower workplace safety standards than the United States because it's a poor country. And in a free society, it's good that different people can make different choices on the benefit-risk spectrum. In other words, the people who worked in that factory, he said, were willing, willingly chose to do that uh, because, because, he said, the, correct, the current system of letting different countries have different rules is working fine. Put bluntly, he's saying because Bangladesh is poor and its people are poor, it's entirely reasonable that they should have to risk having a building fall on them and so that their families don't starve. Now, Iglesias was roundly and justifiably condemned in various quarters, but the real point here is that he wasn't being immoral, he was being amoral. His feeling about the deaths wasn't cruelty, it was indifference. He was trapped inside the logic of the market and his powerful grip on his way of thinking did not allow him to see the actual human consequences of his words, did not allow him to see the actual human meaning of his words. As another writer put it, it is the unacknowledged dehumanizing effect of long-term immersion in a business culture that treats every human interaction as an economic transaction first and foremost. This is what the market, PBUI, what the market does to your soul. Um, it's why we need to rethink our economy because it is an outrage. And that's it for this week. In the future, I hope to have actually a couple of suggestions about things that we might do to move our, about that rethink and actual proposals that we might actually look to follow in order to advance the kind of changes that we need to make if we're to create a society that benefits all and that serves all and that can do that without destroying the earth on which we live. That's it for this week. You have the best week you possibly can and we'll see you next week with 107. Bye.